Beautiful. Let's pray together. Oh, my Father in heaven, we are here on this mountaintop of the week, ready to see and hear and sense and feel your loving presence. We know you are here, Lord, but we want more of you, more of your presence, more of the Holy Spirit, more revelations of your love. Oh, my Father in heaven, I have committed my heart to you, dear Jesus, and so I know you will fulfill your word. Help all of us, Lord, to be in such close communion with you, so intimate with you that we listen to your still small voice. I pray that none of us would miss the fullness of blessing that you have in store for us right here at this divine hour, in this moment, in Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Night by night in our Amazing Prophecies series, we have been focusing especially on the illustrious books of Daniel and Revelation, these twin companion books that belong together. They're inseparable. One explains the other. They supplement and complement each other. And so we're going now to Revelation chapter 12. As I continue my conversion story, albeit conversion must continue to take place every day of our life. Amen. And so in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 11, we read, And they overcame him, Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the what? By the blood of the Lamb, and by the what? Word of their testimony. Every one of us is on a journey. Every one of us is a story unfolding. And by the way, that was a very poignant, very timely illustration that my brother used holding up those uh, jars of grain. Very humbling, isn't it? Life is very short. Has everything to do with my story here today. So notice it says here, they overcame him by the merits of the lamb, the merits of Christ, the blood of the lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms, book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Love the book of Psalms. We're going to Psalms chapter 66. Give you a moment to locate that. Psalms 66, looking there at verse 16. This is Psalm 66 and verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Last week I shared with you how the devil tried to take my life in that near fatal motorcycle accident. It looked like I would die from, potentially, from blood clots. God spared my life in answer to my parents' prayers and in answer to the church members' prayers. And then the devil tried to take my mind in an overdose of LSD, taking four-way blotter acid. I hope you know nothing about this stuff, but nevertheless, I almost felt like I was going to lose my mind completely. But God restored my mind. Is it true that the devil tries to control our thoughts? You may never do an illicit drug, a forbidden drug like LSD, but I'm here to tell you that sin has messed with the wiring. Is that true, yes or no? Sin has messed up and distorted our thinking. But thank God you still have a measure of your mind. How many are thankful for at least the mental faculties you have right now? Amen. And uh, we know that stress takes a number on our thinking patterns, but thank God we have the word of God to bring healing to our mind. Amen. Is Jesus interested in your mental health? Yes, he is. So the devil tried to take my mind. God spared my mind. And then the devil tried to take my freedom as I almost went to jail for three to five years. It really looked like that is what would happen. 
And then, and this was all transpiring around the age of 17, at that time I was working as a shipper and receiver in a printing envelope company, and uh, I was working in a warehouse loading and unloading trucks and so forth, and so I only had a ninth grade education. I hated reading. I hated reading, and uh, I, I just, all I could think about was rock concerts and rock and roll and parties, and I was empty. I was destitute of any joy. I wonder here today, do you have peace? Do you have joy in your heart? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. That's Proverbs 17 and verse 22. And so the devil tried to take my mind. He tried to take my freedom. He tried to take my, my life. And is this true? Look, look at, with me at John 10 and verse 10. John 10 and verse number 10. In John 10 and verse 10, we read this. Words are in red. Who's speaking? This is Jesus. John 10, 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us the abundant life. So I'm asking you here today, what has Satan stolen from you? What has... Has he tried to snatch away from you? What is it that Satan has snatched from you, has, has robbed you of? You've got to think through, what has he taken from me? Would you agree the devil wants to take your joy away? Is that true, yes or no? The devil tries to take away your peace. Is that true, yes or no? Will he try to take away your sanity, yes or no? He will try to take whatever you allow him to take and so we must take back what the devil has stolen. Does God restore broken hearts? Yes or no? Yes, he does. Every one of us has a broken heart that needs to be healed by the power of Jesus Christ. I don't know what condition your marriage is in. But the devil will try to steal away the closeness and the intimacy that he wants to exist in your marriage. I don't know what your parenting is like, but the devil wants to steal away godly parenting. But you can have it. How many agree? You and I can be all that God wants us to be through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so the Bible makes it very clear. Satan is on a war path. Satan is determined to take away from you mentally, physically, emotionally, all sorts of different ways that he will. Would you agree the devil has many strategies? He has many different things that he will do to try to ensnare us. And so I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And if you would be praying for me. Because this message that I'm giving is very personal. No pun intended. It's my personal story. And... I want Jesus alone to be glorified. You know, because when you share your own personal story, I want to do so with the spirit of humility because I'm really nothing. It's all about Jesus. So would you be, raise your hand and tell me if you're going to be praying for me? If you're up here sharing your testimony, I've shared this hundreds and hundreds of times, but every time I need God's help to share my story. And John 1 and verse 12, uh, 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. That is, they rejected him. And you read that in Isaiah 53 as well. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. How many believe in Jesus Christ? So Jesus is dwelling in our hearts. I was on a dance floor in a discotheque in Hartford, Connecticut. My father was a pastor at the local Hartford Seventh-day Adventist Church. And my parents had kicked me out of the house because I was on drugs and drinking. I became an alcoholic at the age of 17 and 18. And so I wanted nothing to do with God, nothing to do with, with um, the Bible or prayer. I just had no interest to me prayer. Uh, uh, going to church was boring, and so I stopped going to church. And so I met Shirley, her name was Shirley, 
on a dance floor in a discotheque at around the age of 18. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to be dating around anymore. I thought this was the one. And so we moved in together, and I decided this is the girl I want to marry. And so we talked about marriage and so forth, but I could sense that she did not feel the same way that I felt towards her. It was a little lopsided. And so that made me feel very insecure. It made me feel uh, discouraged frequently. And so I decided that I would quit smoking and quit drinking for the relationship. Now, she continued to smoke. She continued to drink and so forth. But I decided I'm going to quit all of that because I really thought that that would help us to be on a track to uh, get married. Is it true the devil will try to get you to marry the wrong person? My wife's name is not Shirley. So that just lets you in on the little, a little tidbit there. So let's just be done. By the way, you all met my wife? Raise your hand, sweetheart. Matter of fact, Stan. She is more beautiful today than when I met her. Amen. 33 years. I love you, sweetheart. Because this is kind of weird for me to be talking about another girl up here, but it's part of my testimony. But I want you to know that I'm madly in love with my wife. So at any rate, um, so we, we met each other here on this dance floor. Okay, so we moved in together, and I just had all sorts of grandiose plans that I was going to, you know, marry Shirley. And it surely would have been a mistake. But at any rate, so I quit smoking, quit drinking, quit drugs. And I believe that God was behind that, although I didn't do it for God. I didn't ask for God's strength, but I just did it because determination and decision. I thought this would help our relationship. And so one week after I quit smoking and drinking and drugs, Shirley says to me, I need some time to think. Uh, have you ever heard that terminology used before? I need time to think. I am going to go away for the weekend, and I'll be back after the weekend. Well, I was already feeling insecure, and so I kind of felt very uneasy about this time to think business. And so off she went in her blue Maverick, and um, so I'm there Friday night, and I'm thinking, I don't want to just stay here alone and so I called up one of my drinking buddies. And by the way, they're always available 24-7. Um, if Christians would be as available as drinking buddies, wow, we'd win the, soul, win the world for Christ. But at any rate, um, so my buddy says, yeah, 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 I'll be over. So we, go, he got, we got together and we went to a nearby bar. And I drank and I smoked and I did marijuana and so forth. And so... Then I got back home, and I practically passed out. My heart was very, very lonely. I got up in the morning, and the ceiling is spinning around, and I'm feeling nauseated. I'm making trips to the restroom. I'm throwing up. I mean, just really, really having a hard time. And so I had two problems in Saturday morning. I had a problem of having a hangover and a broken heart. And so I would go and uh, blast the stereo with Led Zeppelin, a Rolling Stones. And I went to the window to see if the Blue Maverick had returned there at the apartment complex. And I just paced back and forth, back and forth. And on that Saturday morning, I said to myself, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I've never touched smoking or drinking or drugs ever since that morning when my heart was broken. I didn't do it for God, but I decided, you see, the thing is this, is that the devil knew when I quit smoking and drinking the first time, the devil knew he had to throw a left curve to me. He knew that he could get to me through Shirley. And so can I say this? Never put somebody above God. Amen. Have no other gods before me. So many people make a God of their husband or a God of their wife. Love your wife, love your husband, but they're not God. Amen. God must come first. Is that true? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, 33. So at any rate, my heart is broken. Finally, she came home and she was crying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I knew that she spent the weekend with an old boyfriend. And that was very, very uh, 
very, very hurtful, very painful. I had a broken heart, and I didn't know what to do with it. I just knew I didn't want to go back to smoking and drinking and drugs. And so around this time, my, uh, my um, father told me, hey, Mark Finley, an evangelist, is coming to town, and he's going to, I'm, I'm sorry, Springfield, Massachusetts, coming to Springfield, Massachusetts, and he's going to be coming, and I think you and Shirley should go to these meetings. So we started attending the meetings. How many have ever heard of Mark Finley, evangelist Mark Finley? So in 1975, Mark Finley held an evangelistic series with my father, and I was at my worst, and they kept asking my mother, or my mother kept asking them, please pray for our pastor's prodigal son. Pray for our prodigal son. So they prayed, and so two years later, I'm showing up there at the Springfield Civic Center, there listening to Mark Finley. Night after night, night after night. And I'm thinking to myself, if I can get Shirley converted, then she'll want to marry me and we'll live happily ever after. You know, have you ever had plans that you hoped were God's plans, but you kind of knew inside it's not God's plans? God has better plans for you. Amen? And so we continued to attend. And then one night, Mark Finley made an altar call, which I believe in. He made an altar call, and he said, if you would like to give your heart to Jesus, if you believe what you're hearing is the truth, come forward. Wow, I felt the Holy Spirit tugging on my heartstrings, and I said, surely, let's go forward. And she says, I'm not going to go forward. You go forward. So I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to go forward if she's not going to go forward. And so it was was like a yo-yo, ping pong, going back and forth, back and forth. Because I didn't want to give my heart to the Lord first, I wanted Shirley and I to do it together. Can I say it again? Put Jesus first. Don't let anyone come before or come between you and God. And so then Mark Finley, one night as we were leaving, he was shaking hands with everybody. And he said, Mark, it's good to see you. I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Can you stay by? And I thought, wow, the evangelist has time for me. And so I said, sure. So after the people dispersed, he escorted us to the front of the auditorium there at the stage. We went onto the stage. We sat down. And he said to me, Mark, I have a scripture I want to share with you. And I want to share it with you right now. Go with me to the book of Joel. Go with me to the book of Joel. And... um, We're going to look here at the book of Joel, chapter 2. Joel, chapter 2. Be praying for me. It's very personal. But I share it because I believe it will be personal to you as well. Joel 2, 25. He says, Mark, this is a promise I want to share with you. I know that this will encourage you, Mark. Verse 25, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. And he says, well, Mark, let me explain this verse to you. Those years you've given into drugs, those years you've given, given into smoking and drinking, if you give your heart to Jesus, he will restore you. But then I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't want to be converted first. I want uh, Shirley to be converted first. So around this time, I uh, went to my dad and I said, Dad, and I'm leaning over the counter looking down at this pastor's desk, preparing a sermon or something like that. And I'm leaning over and I said, Dad, do you think there's anything I can do in God's work? Well, my dad, my dad didn't... uh, tell me how he really felt at the time, but he said, oh, okay, okay. Now, you got to keep in mind, I was a hippie. Have you ever heard of hippies? All right. I was, how many grew up as a hippie? You know, you remember the hippie era? At any rate, uh, I felt that I wanted to have what Mark Finley had. I wanted to have what my brother Dana had. My brother Dana had a dramatic conversion story. Remember, I'm number two out of four boys. He's number three. He had a dramatic conversion experience. He became a coal porter. 
and uh, a canvasser. And so I noticed that he had love for Jesus. So I, I was leaning over the counter and I said, Dad, do you think there's anything I can do in God's work? And my dad said it was like his heart was glass. It shattered. He didn't know what to say to me because I had been a hippie. I was a high school dropout. Can I say this? No matter how much education you have or don't have, you can work for God. You can work for God. You don't need to have all sorts of education before you go to work for God. By the way, this is the best education is reading the word of God. Amen. So you got to keep in mind, though, I still didn't like to read. So anyway, we're, we're, Shirley and I are going to the meetings, and I could see the handwriting on the wall that God was not for this relationship, but I didn't want to surrender it. I was going through a struggle, very intense struggle, because the devil knew that this was around a turning point of my life. And so I, would, um, I, I, I decided I got to move back home and because uh, I knew we were living in sin, and so I decided I have to go home. And so I called my mom and I said, Mom, I, I, is it okay? I want to move back home. Yes, that's what they were praying for. Because they were like, Shirley's not the one, Mark. I didn't want to hear that, but I felt like, okay. Because they told me, Mark, if you want God to bless the relationship, you're living in sin, you need to be, move back home. So when I called up, my mo mother was so happy, she contacted uh, Dave Holton, Pastor Dave Holton, my father's associate pastor, who had a pickup. And so he backed uh, up to the apartment there at the apartment complex. And we started loading my belongings in the pickup. And then there's Shirley. Now keep in mind, I quit smoking, quit drinking, quit drugs. And there she's at the kitchen table with a cigarette and with a beer can. And she's crying, you know, why do you have to move out? And I said, well, I just feel we need to have God in our relationship. And you got to keep in mind, I wasn't really following God yet, but I thought, you know, this would help our relationship. So anyway, fast forward. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to these meetings with her. God is working in my heart. And so around this time, like I say, I was feeling like I needed a change in my life. So I knelt down in my bedroom and the sun was spilling in through the bedroom window. And I knelt down looking out the window and I said, God, I would like to work for you. Now, I wasn't even fully surrendered, but I said, God, I want to work for you. I want to, to do some kind of work for you. And it was like the devil piped up and said, give me a break. <laughs> I was not qualified. I was not all that. I mean, I, my life was still a soap opera. It was a mess. But three days later, out of the clear blue, my father got a call from our uncle, Jerry Fox. We had not heard from him for 10 years. And he calls right out of the clear blue after that fervent, simple, short prayer. Got to keep in mind, I didn't have a prayer life, but that was a simple, honest, sincere prayer request. And so he says, hey, Bruce, my dad, um, do you think Mark can come out here and help us get started a vegetarian restaurant and fine art gallery? And my dad came to me and said, Mark, I think this is a call from God because they knew we got to get him away from Shirley. <laughs> and God was on the side of my parents. So at any rate, I said, um, I said, really? Your uncle would like you to come out there and help get started a vegetarian restaurant and find art gallery. So immediately I'm thinking, how does Shirley factor into this? <laughs> So at any rate, I was just kept struggling to give up this girl. I didn't want to give her up. And so I told her about this and her attitude was, yes, go. And I said, well, you know, we can, uh, we can work together for God out there. The handwriting was already on the wall. And so I felt the Holy Spirit tugging on my heartstrings. And around this time, I said, Dana. Let's go to California together. Because I looked up to him, even though he was younger than I. I looked up to him because he had a genuine conversion experience. And so he says, well, Mark, I'll pray about it. I said, okay. Then I would come to him the next day. Well, Mark, I think I might go. The day after that, I'm not sure God wants me to go. And so I decided if I'm going to give up Shirley, 
I need Dana to be there with me because he is my spiritual mentor. He's my spiritual counselor, and he would pray for me. And so I was able to talk him into going. And so on the eve of our departure, on the eve of my departure, In my 1966 satellite convertible, about the only thing I had to show for my meager paycheck. But um, my father says, Mark, let's go for a walk. And so we walked around the block and underneath the starlit sky. And my dad says, Mark, you know what? You're going to look back at this as being the turning point in your life. My dad's words were prophetic. I thank God for my parents to this day. I thank God that even though my father has dementia, whenever I call him up, I know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a lot of love. I want to say this, that I would not be where I am today without my father's love and without my mother's love. Love of the parents. You know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. You know what? Loving parents have a profound influence on their children. I want to say wholeheartedly, never, ever give up on your children. Never give up on your grandchildren. Because sometimes I'll hear people say, oh, they're on their own. And that's just, you know, yes, they may be on their own. But do you still love them? Do you still love them enough? The best thing you can do to show your love to your children or grandchildren is to pray for them. Amen to pray for them. That is the most important thing. And so, so the next morning it came time to leave. And my brother Dana is like, he's starting to waver a little bit. He says, I'm not so sure God wants us to go together. I think God may want you to go on alone, 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 alone. I heard that word alone. I didn't like that word because I was willing to give up surely, but I thought I'm not going to give up my brother Dana. I wasn't fully surrendered yet. I was getting close. And so we said goodbye to my parents, and off we went. And I, a couple years ago, I saw a picture for the first time that my parents took of Dana and I taking off in on my satellite convertible. So we're rambling down the highway, and I'm thinking, you know, California was the place to go. I mean, we were in Connecticut, 3,000 miles to California. And so, uh, so we're riding there on the highway. And then my brother Dana says, Mark, can you pull over? I says, why? He says, I'm not so sure that God wants me to go with you. I think God may want you to go on alone. There's that word again. And so I said, okay, we pulled over and he says, Mark, let's pray for a sign. I thought, oh, wow. What if God gives him a sign that he is to turn, um, to turn around and let him go back home and for me to go on alone? And so we prayed. And then after we prayed, after he prayed, I'm thinking, okay, I can interpret the sign in my favor that God wants him to go, and I to go together. I didn't want to be alone. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you don't want to be alone? Come on now, raise your hand if you ever felt that way. You don't want to be alone. Well, I didn't want to be alone. And so we're rambling down the highway, and he said to me again, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, just kept pressing his petitions. And he said, Mark, go ahead and pull over. So he pulled over, and he said the same old prayer, very familiar prayer, Lord, give us a sign if you want uh, me to go back home and then Mark to go on alone. There's that word again. And so we finally made it to York, Pennsylvania, where we stayed uh, over the weekend. We didn't want to travel on the Sabbath. We stayed uh, they were over the weekend with the Mummert family, and they were close friends of the family where my father used to pastor there in uh, York, Pennsylvania. So we stayed there over the weekend, and my brother was spending a lot of time, an exorbitant amount of time in prayer, and that made me a little nervous. And so on Sunday morning, he says to me, Mark, can I drive? Well, sure. So I hand him the keys. We said goodbye to the Mummerts, and off we went. And then I noticed that he wasn't slowing down for our exit. And I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He decided he was going to drive us home. And, uh, and I said, Dana, pull over, pull over. You're going to miss the exit. And so he pulled over uh, with much reservation. He pulled over. And I said, you're not going to drive anymore. So we switched places, swapped places. And uh, he had turned the car off. And I was shaking. He was like, what's wrong with you, man? What's wrong with me? 
And so he said, Mark, can we pray again? I said, you know, I'm thinking to myself, can't we pray when we get to California? And so he said to me, uh, yeah, Mark, let me pray again. So he prayed the same prayer. And after I prayed for a sign, and then after he finished praying, I went to turn on the car. Click, 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 click. I look at him and he's smiling. That made me upset. So, so I got out of the car. I popped the hood. It's like, what is wrong with my car? And then my brother Dana's coming around and putting his arm around me. He says, oh, Mark, people in the Bible went, you know, Job or whatever. You know, I can't remember everything. Abraham, Job went through trials. Mark, God will be with us. God's in control. That wasn't my worry. <laughs> and so at any rate, I flagged down a car. Uh, we got a, a jump. Uh, jump start and went to a nearby service station. The assessment, uh, yes, your battery is dead. Uh, you need to replace the battery. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a brand new battery. Little did I know that God can kill a battery in answer to prayer. You know, I think about Balaam. Think about Balaam, determined he's going to go and do what he wants to do. And God was putting up some roadblocks. How many are thankful for those roadblocks? God can try to stop us going down a wrong path. We don't want to resist the Holy Spirit. Amen? We don't want to resist the Holy Spirit. And so, and so uh, we got a brand. I, I handed them my parents' credit card because my parents had loaned me their credit card. They just wanted me to go. Get away from Shirley. Go. Here. Here's a credit card. <laughs> credit card. You know, and uh, so that we would have money for gas and the hotel and eating and so forth. See you later. Bye. We love you. And so, uh, so I got a new battery slapped in there. And so then we start heading back home. Uh, pardon me. We start heading to California. Now, keep in mind, we were broken down for two hours. How many hours? Two hours. Don't forget it because God is in the details. God's timing is always perfect. Amen. And so we're driving along. And finally, towards evening, he says, Mark. Let's stop and get a bite to eat. Here comes a Howard Johnson's. Go, go ahead. Take the exit. I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what he's up to. And so we pulled into the uh, parking lot there, and, and he said, Mark, go ahead in, and in about um, 10 minutes, I'll be in, okay? I said, okay. So I went in, and he said, you go ahead and order some, you know, grilled cheese and tomato. Yeah vegetarian delight, grilled cheese and tomato and french fries and root beer. I knew that's what he wanted. But anyway, so I got that and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And so here comes my brother sheepishly comes to the table and I'm like, I know what he just did. Sure enough, he sat down and said, mom and dad want us to call them. I said, oh brother, mom and dad want to talk to you. Oh brother. I was very upset. You mean to tell me you got mom and dad involved in this now? Because I knew what would happen. Sure enough, they're at the payphone. You remember payphones? At any rate, they said, Mark, if Dana wants to come back home, you have to turn around and bring him back home. And I said, we're already here in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. There's no way I'm going to turn around. I just had tunnel vision. Oh, this is the way it's got to be. Didn't want to change my plans. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16 and verse 9. Let's go there. Go to with me to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. I quote this scripture a lot because I believe it. I experience it. Proverbs 16 and verse 9. A man's heart plans. Say plans. Plans his way. What's the next word after the word way? But the Lord does what? Directs his steps. I got another scripture for you. How many realize every day we need to sense God's guidance in our life? In the details. Amen. Go with me to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. All righty. And verse 16. Isaiah 42 and verse 16. I will bring the blind, Isaiah 42, 16. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. 
I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. Let me show you another one. Psalms 32. I hope you uh, memorize these scriptures. I, uh, Psalms 32. Psalms 32. And looking there, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Is that encouraging? Now go with me to Isaiah 30. We want God to guide in every detail of our life. Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. Verse 21. Isaiah 30, verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, what? This is the way, walk in it, whether you turn to the right hand or whether you turn to the left. I could show you scores more scriptures about how God wants to guide in our life. And so, and so uh, on the phone, I said, Mom, Dad, I can't turn around. Mark, listen, just stay there at the Howard Johnson's Hotel. We'll pay for it. Just stay there and let's talk tomorrow morning when we're all calm and we can, uh, we can decide this together. And I said, there's just no way. And then all of a sudden my brother takes off and I'm like, what is he doing? He just bolted out of the, out of the hotel, uh, out of the restaurant there. It was a restaurant and a hotel, Howard Johnson's. And so mom, dad, I got to go. I left them practically dangling. And so I come darting out of the restaurant and I'm looking for my brother and I'm thinking, did he just run away? <laughs> and so there he was around the corner and he was like this. And I came running up to him. I said, Dana, Dana. And he looked at me with a look of love and he says, Mark, I don't want to do anything to hurt you. I just want to do God's will. And you know, the Bible says in Proverbs 15 verse one, let's go there. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up strife. He had a soft word, and it was touching my heart. Now go with me to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. By the way, can I encourage you to associate your circumstances in life to the word of God? How many agree God has words to speak to you in every circumstance in life? Amen. Hebrews 4 and verse 7. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David today, after such a long time, as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, what everybody do not harden your hearts. Now go with me to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Look at verse 51. This is Acts seven fifty-one. If you have a say amen. Verse 51. You stiff-necked the word stiff neck means stubborn. You stubborn and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. And I was resisting. By the way, it's better to resist the devil than to resist the Holy Spirit. And so I was, I was hardening my heart because I didn't want to be alone. You've got to be careful how you will let fear dominate your mind and your judgment and your decisions. And so... I said, okay, come on, Dana, let's go. So it softened my heart for a minute, but then I thought, I'm not going alone. So I said, come on, let's go. And so we were disagreeing, and finally, we decided to pray again. Same prayer. And after we prayed, I said, Dana, I'll take you back home. And I'm thinking, did I just say that? Yeah, that was your voice. And I started to feel something immediately. 
I started to feel something right down in here, something I'd never really felt before. And I said it again because he's like in disbelief. I said, Dana, I will take you back home. It's like, yeah, I did say that. So I started up the car. Of course, it started right away. Started up the car, and we got back on the highway, this time going, going north, back towards Connecticut. And I said, Dana, I am so sorry for putting pressure on you. And he said, Mark, I forgive you. Isn't that neat thing about siblings? Doesn't always work out that way, but it was working out that way. And uh, so he said, uh, Mark, um, you may not have to take me back home. He said, Mark, and he started rummaging through his maps. He was my GPS before GPS was even thought of. So he had maps. So he was looking at the map. He says, Mark, take this exit. I said, why? Mark, trust me. So I take an exit. He said, take a left, take a right. And he led me to an apparently run-down train station that was, we hoped was still in service. And he said, Mark, let's pray that I can get an Amtrak train and get it from Martinsburg, West Virginia, to Hartford, Connecticut. And he said, Mark, let's pray about it. So we prayed. And he checked the train schedule, and a train was coming in two hours to take him to Hartford. God stopped my car for two hours so that we wouldn't go far beyond, because things were volatile, thanks to yours truly. And so, at any rate... I praise God for his patience with Mark Fox. Has God had to be patient with you a time or two? Come on, make me feel a little bit better. I'm up here being vulnerable. So anyway, yeah, God's patience. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. So at any rate, um, he purchased a ticket. We were able to get together some of abbreviated version of his belongings. And uh, with a ticket in his hand and a duffel bag and just some, me some meager belongings, we stood there at the train station looking up the tracks there on the pl railroad platform. And here comes the train. And we embraced and I said, Dana, you have been such a blessing to me. You've been such a good example. He said, I'm going to miss you. He says, Mark, I'm going to miss you too. We can talk to each other over the phone. And I said, I love you. And he said, I love you. And the train stopped there in front of us. Doors opened. Bye, Mark. Bye, Dana. And he walked up into the boxcar. And the doors closed. And I'm trying to get one last glance at the brother who modeled Jesus for me who modeled the prayer life. You see, just prior to this, we shared a t twin, bed, uh, twin beds in a, in a bedroom there at our pastor's parsonage. And I noticed that he would get up early in the morning while it was still dark, six, five, six in the morning. And I noticed that he would go to a nearby cornfield to be alone with God. And he would be there for hours. And then when he would return, I looked at his face and I saw peace, something that I did not have. Does God want us to have peace? Yes or no? Read, that's a good homework assignment for you. Study the word peace. Do a re research about quietness and peace and calmness. That's what God wants to give us. And so that, that brother modeled Jesus. And I wanted what he had but I didn't know it would come about this way. God knows how to give you peace. You have to give up your way. You have to give up your plans. You have to sacrifice everything for Christ. And so, um, so I looked as I said goodbye and I watched the train pass into the horizon and then I saw my lonely car and the snow was falling there in November of 1977. And I looked and I saw my lonely car. And I was just holding back the tears. And I got in my car and I bowed my head and I cried the tears of a lifetime. 
And I prayed right from the depths of my heart. Dear Lord, be with me. Be my companion. And it was like Jesus. I felt like Jesus sat down next to me and reassured me that he would be my companion. And I discovered that there is a friend that stays closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24. And the tears are just streaming down my face. No, I don't have Shirley. That's over. Don't have my brother. Oh, we can talk over the phone, but don't have my parents. Don't have my buddies. Don't even have the job. They already said goodbye to me at my job. My job's, you know, not going to have that job anymore. Going to a place I've never been before. I barely even knew my uncle. I didn't know anybody out there. And I started up my car and started heading towards California. Snow was falling, as I mentioned. And I found myself with a new peace that I'd never, ever had before. A peace that passeth understanding. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And so I found myself talking to Jesus because he was in the car with me. Talking to him. Nobody, it wasn't like, okay, now I'm going to pray. It was a conversation. How many agree prayer is to be a conversation with God? Where you're just communing with him as to your best friend. Is Jesus your best friend? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And then that evening... I checked into a hotel there in Virginia. And who do you think I was thinking of as I was going to sleep? Jesus. I woke up the next morning in that hotel all alone. No, I woke up. Oh, yeah, I felt lonely. But I reached out. I used that loneliness to reach out to God. You know, loneliness is not a curse. It's rather something that God can use to have us to reach out to God. Some of you might be experiencing an empty nest syndrome. And I suppose my wife and I, are, our son is almost 20, our daughter is 15, so we got a little more time. But, um, but there will be times in our life when we do feel alone. And the Bible says, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 and verse number 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God promises to not leave us. He promises to be our helper. He promises to be our best friend. Do you believe this, yes or no? This is a promise we must learn to live and depend on Bible promises because there's enough power in that, that verse right there to give you victory over every perceptment, over every weakness, over every sin. Let's cherish it. By the way, do you memorize scripture? I hope you do. There's a scripture worth memorizing. Work on that today, perhaps. Fear not, for I am what? For I am with you. And so... What happened while I was on that three days travel alone with Jesus is I would listen to Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> you know what I did with all those albums? How many remember LPs and 45s? You know, I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of rock and roll LPs. Boy, they would be worth a lot of money today. And 45s. But I made a garbage man happy before I even went to California. I knew God wanted me to give up this rock and roll. And by the way, I appreciate the music you all have in this church. I am very delighted because it's not this way in some churches I visit. I am thankful that there's not rock and roll in this church. 
I praise God. And yet, you know, there's some contemporary songs and so forth. Absolutely beautiful, in my humble opinion. Because when God got a hold of me, he led me to say goodbye to Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. How many agree? You can't have both. And I, I made a garbage man happy. I didn't see him take all of those albums uh, that were there at, at the edge of the street where the garbage truck would go. Instead, he took those and took them to the front cab. <laughs> all right. So here I am. My, my parents had different kind of music, and we had recorded some of it on cassette tape. Remember cassette tapes? And so I would listen to Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and the music went along with my falling in love with Jesus. Keep in mind, I fell in love with Jesus because he was there when I was alone. Are you in love with Jesus? You know, the Bible says in Matthew 22, to love him with all of our heart and with all of our strength. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. And so I also began to listen to an evangelist by the name of E.E. E. Cleveland, a Jamaican, the late E.E. E. Cleveland. You probably remember E.E. E. Cleveland. E.E. E. Cleveland was an evangelist, Jamaican evangelist. And we had attended some of his meetings. Anyway, I got a hold of these cassette tapes. And so I listened to him preaching mile after mile, hour after hour, listening to godly music, and listening to E.E. E. Cleveland preach. You know what he was preaching about? How Jesus Christ is our righteousness. How we have no righteousness of our own. That we can trust in Jesus and in his righteousness. Friends, is this good news? You can lean on Jesus and believe that you're accepted in the beloved Ephesians 1, 6. And the Bible says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. How many are thankful? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Matthew eleven twenty eight. I'm asking you, do you have peace and rest in your heart right now? I don't know what you're struggling with, but Jesus will give you that peace. So by the time I ended up in California... I was ready to shout from the rooftops, I know my Redeemer lives. I was ready to shout down the streets and let people know, I know Jesus Christ personally. Do you? And here, many years later, I know where I'm going. Do you? Do you know where you're going? I know where I'm going. Can you categorically, unequivocally say, I know in whom I have believed in. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. 2 Timothy 1, 12, 12. If you were to die, God forbid, today, tomorrow, are you sure you would be saved? Every one of us can be saved. And we can know that we are in a saving relationship right now. Beloved, I write to you. I write to you that you may know that you have eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who has not the son has not life. Do you have the son? Yes or no? You know, I think about, I think about the sun shining in your face, on some of your faces right now. The Bible says the son of righteousness is, has his sunshine, right? Jesus is sunshine. Son of righteousness shines upon us with healing in his wings. Malachi 4, verse 2. So there in California, I lived in Carmel Valley, California, Central California, with my uncle and his friend. And in the early morning, I would do what my brother Dana did. I would get up early before the crack of dawn, get up early. And I would take my Bible. Remember, I was the one who hated reading. Uh-huh. I did not read. And remember now, now all of a sudden I have a prayer life. This is all new. Surrender is all new. And within days, I found myself. I'd get up early in the morning. I felt Jesus waking me up early in the morning. But then again, I went to bed early. <laughs> if you want to get up early, you need to go to bed earlier than midnight, right? So at any rate, I... I got up 
And I took my Bible and I took a book by the name Desire of Ages by Ellen G. White on the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. And I found a place out in the woods. It wasn't a cornfield, but it was out in the woods where I could look up and see the mountains there in Carmel Valley. And I knelt down and I prayed. And I felt the peace of God. And I began to open and read. Now, keep in mind, I read very slow. I had to reread different sentences and read. And then the tears would fall from my cheeks to the page because I couldn't believe what a loving Savior I have and how he wiped out all of my big past mistakes. How many are thankful that your past is covered by the blood of Jesus? Philippians 3, 13 and 14. I know we have to close, but I want to go to this scripture with you real quick. I'm closing, but go with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, uh, verse 12. Not that I have already, Philippians 3, 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. How many things? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How many are thankful? Forget the things that are behind in terms of its guilt. Oh, yeah, you'll, you'll think of different things in the past, but the guilt's not there. How many are thankful that you don't need to walk in guilt any longer? Guilt, guilt will really, really bring you stress. Guilt can keep you up at night. Guilt can rob you of your peace and joy. So I'm asking you, are you ready to shout from the rooftop that Jesus Christ is your savior? Are you ready to let people know that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and savior? Now, little did I ever know, and I'll share more of my story in subsequent messages while I'm here, because I do want to share with you how I met my wife. Do you want to hear that real quick? No, okay. Um, yeah, I can't get into it too much, but let me just say this, that when I was there in California, I worked there and get up early in the morning, like I mentioned, and then I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, lead me to people you want me to witness to. And that prayer he's been answering ever since 1977. If you and I will say, Lord, use me, he will use you. Even though I had only a ninth grade education. So I was there in California almost a year, almost a year. And then my parents had encouraged me, Mark, come move back home and you can work on your GED and your dad has a call to be a pastor in Chicago. And so I told my parents, I'll pray about it. Well, the Lord led me to leave California to go back to Hartford, Connecticut to help my parents relocate. And I would live with them to work on my GED. That was the plan. And my father rebaptized me. And that church that I had apostatized from, that church that I had no use for those church members, be careful. If you think church members are your hypocrites, you might need their prayers. And so they prayed for the pastor's prodigal. So when I showed up there to be baptized, it was an answer to the church member's prayer. Some of you might need to be rebaptized. We're going to have a baptism next week. Some of you need to be baptized or rebaptized. But let me say this in closing. I was there in Hartford just pleading with God to keep me close to him. We relocated to Chicago. And the first day I was there, I was asked to work as a, a clerk at the register at the Adventist Book Center there in Brookfield, Illinois. And I worked as a as a sales clerk. And then who comes in? This is in Chicago. Guess who came in one day? Mark Finley. He didn't come to see me. He was probably just as shocked as I was to see. And he said, Mark, why don't you come 
to the Lake Union Soul Winning Institute and will train you to be a soul winner. I said to myself, I'll pray about it. And the Lord led me to attend the Lake Union Soul Winning Institute. And I graduated in 1980 with a Bible instructor certificate. I only had a ninth grade education. And I became a Bible worker for three years. And I held evangelistic meetings like this. In 1979, I began to hold meetings, 1980, 1981, 82. And I did meetings with a ninth grade education. What's your excuse? God wants to use teenagers. God wants to use children. I'm so delighted to see the kids participating at the piano, participating in scripture reading. I say this, let children be empowered by parents and grandparents. Yes, let them respect you, but use them. And so I then went up to Andrews University, and with God's blessing, I was able to go from a ninth grade education to a master's of divinity in five years. But the best part, and that was the promise of the Holy Spirit. I, I wish I had more time to go into it. My testimony is on my YouTube channel. But anyway, so um, I want to end with how I met my wife. I met my wife. She had just come up from Dominican Republic, and she didn't have a chance. I saw her right when she first came, and I befriended her. And two years later, we got married. And so I graduated with my MDiv and also my MRS, Mrs. Fox. And so I praise God. Our children are miracles. Maybe I will. I, I don't have time to get into more stories, but I have many, many more miracles to share with you. But I'm asking you. What's Jesus up to in your life? How many agree Jesus is always up to something? Always up to something. Some of you need to be baptized. Some of you need to be rebaptized. If you feel a need, as I close, if you feel a need to be baptized either next week or in the near future or to be rebaptized, would you just raise your hand and let Pastor Mark know? Just raise your hand. And just hold it up while I can uh, assess. There were a number of you that raised your hand last week. Is there anyone who would like to be baptized by immersion? Maybe this will be your first time. Maybe it's a rebaptism. Raise your hand so I can recognize you. Yes, God bless you. Anybody else like to be baptized or rebaptized? Praise God. Praise God. I see your hand. Yes, anybody else like to be baptized or rebaptized? And final appeal. How many would like to get up in the morning and fall in love with Jesus every morning? Are you willing to do that? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much, Lord, for helping me share my story. I pray that Mark Fox was not uplifted, only Jesus. Help us to love you, Jesus. And give us a testimony. In Jesus' name, amen.